Warm greetings to all of you, my Anuwim brothers and sisters. Welcome to the next installment of the, the 12th installment of this series on the, on the Lord's Prayer. I had started to call these, these uh, talks lockdown lectures, uh, but last time I was in the United States and uh, I definitely was not locked down when I was there, so I, I couldn't call it that. Uh, now that I'm back in, uh, in the Philippines, and I'm experiencing, again, the much stricter anti-COVID measures. Uh, I'm tempted to call this a lockdown, a lockdown lecture again. In fact, just yesterday, I was released from a six-day strict quarantine in a quarantine hotel. So uh, it's very good to be out of there. I've never stayed in one room that long in my whole life <laughs> without ever going out of the room. It's quite an experience. Something like solitary confinement, but more comfortable, air-conditioned uh, hotel room. <laughs> and uh, I was served three meals a day there. Anyway, the situation here in Manila is much, much better than when I left. Uh, when I left at the beginning of October, here in Metro Manila anyway, we were in alert level four. And then just the day after I left, uh, or when I uh, uh, arrived in, uh, in New Jersey, it was reduced to uh, alert level three. So that's why my quarantine was shortened from 10 days down to six days. And then uh, since I have arrived last week, uh, the alert level has been lowered again to alert level two. So I'm told that now children can go out of their houses for the first time in 20 months. So that's good news for the children and for the families. Nevertheless, we are still not yet gathering in person. Uh, so these formation talks will still be broadcast like this. It turns out, however, that these, uh, th this limitation, this uh, necessity of broadcasting these talks has turned out to be for the benefit of our Anawa members in the States, uh, many of whom are following this series on YouTube. Uh, so greetings to all of you as well, my brothers and sisters in the States, even though you're only going to watch this on a, on a recording. Uh, it was a very great joy for me to be with you last month, month of October, to share our annual retreat together and uh, simply to share life together. Uh, I didn't realize until I got there how uh, isolated I had started to feel uh, here in the Philippines under the lockdowns, and perhaps even it got even worse uh, after the death of Sister Barbara, and there were even fewer people here around the center. In any case, we're together now, at least we're together virtually, uh, I hope the technology is working, this uh, microphone's working, I hope that this recording is working. I have to record this talk because uh, this afternoon I have to give another talk uh, to, the, uh, to a, a group of seminarians also on Zoom, so I can't do two things at once. So, uh, but virtually I can't. I'll record this, and while you're listening to this, I'll be talking to the seminarians in Cebu. Okay, so we thank God for the, the possibilities that technology has opened up for our our, for the building up of our Anuim life. Let's begin our time together with prayer, asking the power, powerful intercession of our Queen Mother and of our protector, our patron, St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Queen Mother Mary, we come before you begging an outpouring of grace upon the whole world. Open the eyes of our hearts with your faith. Draw us deeply into the life of the Church as we ponder the mysteries of creation, redemption, and sanctification celebrated in your maternal heart. Lead us into the Eucharistic heart of your Son to drink of the inexhaustible fountain of the divine will. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Prayer to St. Joseph, protector of the Anuim. Beloved St. Joseph, protector of the Anuim, watch over us day and night. Preserve us from occasions of sin and obtain for us purity of soul and body. Grant us a spirit of sacrifice, humility, and courage, a burning love for Jesus in the Eucharist and a tender love for Mary, our mother. St. Joseph, be with us living, be with us dying, and intercede for us to Jesus, our merciful Savior. Amen. 
O Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Eucharistic Heart of Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Francis, pray for us. Sister Barbara, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, I hope that my voice lasts through this presentation. As some of you know, I, I came down with a cold uh, before I even left the States, and it got worse when I was traveling, so I still have a little bit of uh, congestion in my head. We have entered into the month of November, which draws us up and beyond this world, or the life in this world. We look to the saints in glory, uh, we look to our brothers and sisters who are being purified, and uh, we realize that they are showing us very important things about our life, things that we often forget. Namely, that we will die, and that we are made for eternal glory, uh, and that we're sometimes not ready to enter into eternal glory. So uh, we need to be purified as well. So these uh, uh, awarenesses that come to us by celebrating the saints, the communion of saints, uh, uh, help us recognize the bigger picture, which is very often put by people of less faith uh, in a negative way. Uh, it's put in a negative way as if to say uh, uh, the end of life in this world is a bad thing or what happens after death is a bad thing, uh, not for those who belong to God. In fact, uh, we're much better off remembering that we will die <laughs> so that we will live well. It's, uh, it's those who forget or who deny that they will die who tend to waste the precious time of life in this world. So uh, we don't forget that we will die. We, we keep it in mind. Memento mori is the Latin expression. Remember that we will die. Remember to die. Now the traditional terms for the three states of the church or the three conditions of people who belong to or who are united in the one body of Christ are these three. The church triumphant, the church suffering, and the church militant. The church triumphant, the saints in heaven, the church suffering, souls in purgatory, and the church militant, that's the rest of us who are still in battle, in, uh, in, in uh, the battle of life in this world, a mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Now, more recent church documents have not uh, used these exact terms. They don't, they're not that common anymore, church triumphant, church suffering, church militant. Um, and some, some scholars have questioned whether these terms are, are uh, it should be used at all because, after all, in Christ we are all triumphant. All of us in the body of Christ are triumphant in Christ, whether we're in this life, whether we're in purgatory, or whether in heaven. And, uh, and because of our union with one another, all of us are, are suffering as well. Because, uh, as St. Paul says in his famous passage on the uh, analogy of the church as a body, he says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members share its joy. So uh, since we're all united, we are all uh, members, we are all, we are all militant. Uh, we are all fighting for one another, helping one another in this, in this battle. And that's all true. Of course it's all true. Uh, the problem is that uh, saying that we're all one in Christ uh, doesn't help us recognize these three distinct states, different states, uh, in which we may belong in this uh, one united body. So, and there really are three different states or three different conditions of church members of all our brothers and sisters. I think the recent death of Sister Barbara has been a good reminder to all of us in Anuem of this. Uh, she's no longer with us in this life, but she's still with us because she's in heaven and we're united with the saints in heaven. So uh, that's why I, I included her name at the end of the invocations when we prayed just a moment ago. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in the end, we know there's one church, and that's the church triumphant. That's the goal. That's where the church is headed toward eternal glory. But we are not all there yet. We're not completely there yet, and that's obvious enough. Uh, all we have to do is look around. But we should not forget where we're headed. We should not forget our destiny or our destination. In fact, later this month, uh, we're going to celebrate the Feast of Christ the King, Christ the triumphant King, uh, Christ the one who, who reigns and who wants to share the fullness of his reign with his whole body, meaning with all of us. All who humbly welcome the gift of his kingdom 
in faith. Now, since I was just released from quarantine yesterday, I can't, I can't help but think of this. It strikes me as a very good reflection on the mysterious stage we call purgatory. Um, I, I've been in the Philippines a full week already, but uh, uh, because and all of you who are in the States, all my friends in the States and relatives said goodbye to me a week ago already. Uh, but when I finally got out, everybody started uh, saying to me yesterday and today, Oh, welcome back, welcome back, welcome home. How are you? How was your trip? <laughs> How was your visit? Uh, which sounded funny to me because my trip was a week ago, uh, and I've been I've been uh, you know locked up for 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 a week. So uh, from the perspective of of those welcoming me, the saints in the Philippines, I had just arrived. But from my experience, uh, I, I had been here already. I just not yet fully. Uh, release, something like this, the souls in purgatory. Okay, I don't know if that would help you reflect on it. That's just my personal experience. I hope you have the handout that uh, was prepared for today so that you can more easily follow along. We are now turning to the Catechesis on the Lord's Prayer number 12. The title is Forgive Us Our Debts. This is from the general audience of Pope Francis, April 10th, 2019. So this is Catechesis number 12 out of a total of 16 in this series of uh, the Pope's uh, Wednesday general audiences. And this one is the Pope's reflections on the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Remember, there are seven petitions. There are three that are directed to what relates more, uh, more directly to God. His name, hallowed be his name, hallowed be, uh, may his kingdom come and may his will be done. And then the, the last four petitions which is the part we're in now, uh, are more directed to what relates to our needs on this, our earthly journey. So our bread, we covered last time, this time forgiveness, then uh, the, the dealing with temptations and deliver us from evil. So when we met last time, uh, that was three weeks ago, uh, we reflected on the fourth petition, give us our daily bread. The fourth petition is the first of the second set of petitions, just to give a few highlights of that talk so that you can remember where we are in this sequence of catechesis, uh, we were reminded by the Pope that uh, the request that we make for bread, that is the request or the petition that we make for any and every basic need, reminds us that we are needy, reminds us that we are beggars before God. But Every need can, at the same time, uh, open us up more deeply to a connection with God. And this is how Pope Francis put it in the talk last time. The whole of human existence, with its most concrete and mundane problems, can become prayer. I love that. The whole of human existence, with all its problems, with all its needs, as basic as bread, can become prayer. That's a good thing to reflect on because, you know, a lot of people say that uh, the existence of suffering in the world, the existence of hunger in the world, or of any problems in the world, is, is a proof that there's no God, or there's a, it's a proof that, at least, that God doesn't really take care of us or, or love us. This insight of Pope Francis that, our, 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 that, we, that w when we make this plea for bread, we're opening ourselves to God, it turns that accusation around. It, it completely reverses the accusation that God doesn't care about us. In fact, every need, every suffering is a connection with God, and not a proof that there's no God. It's a connection with God, an opening to God. So that's a point we learned last time. Another highlight from uh, last, the last talk was the awareness that we are not asking only for bread for ourselves but for all who hunger. When we say, give us our bread, we are including the urgent request that God provide food for the hungry, that he care for the poor. We're praying that he do that. Uh, so we're praying for our hunger to be satisfied, and we're also praying for the hunger of our brothers and sisters to be satisfied. We, we can't pray only for ourselves and not want bread for our brothers and sisters. That would not be prayer. That, that we wouldn't be opening ourselves to God if we're not opening a path for God to bless others as well. 
that was last time. And then at the end, if you remember, uh, Pope Francis pointed out the example of the young boy in the, uh, in the mul miraculous multiplication of the loaves, that young boy who already had his daily bread. He had five loaves. <laughs> in a sense, he didn't have to ask, uh, uh, give us our daily bread. He had food for himself, but, for himself, but he offered what he had to Jesus. And that's what gave Jesus the opening for the uh, miraculous multiplication. So what that example tells us is that, yes, God provides bread. He provides bread. We ask him and he provides. But he also expects us to share with others uh, what he gives us. So that was part of last time. Now, there was, there's much, much more to the mystery of bread, of course, of daily bread, especially once you turn to the Eucharist, which is the, uh, the fullest expression of our, our daily bread. But we can't go into that. We have to move on to today's topic. So let's turn to what the Holy Father has to say about the fifth petition, starting with number one. Dear brothers and sisters, after asking God for our daily bread, the Lord's Prayer enters the sphere of our relationships with others. Jesus teaches us to ask the Father, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Just as we need bread, we also need forgiveness. This too. This every day. If you looked ahead to the reflection questions, you know that I put this in there. Do you, do you, what's your experience of needing forgiveness and bread every day? Okay, so that's, that's for later. But here it is, the fifth petition, which we normally say when we pray the Our Father. We say, for, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is one of the petitions that can be said to have two parts to it. Forgive us as we forgive others. The only other petition that has this two-part uh, character, uh, the only other one that uses the word as, is the third petition where we ask that uh, the Father, we ask the Father that his will be done on earth as in heaven. So that this word as uh, occurs twice in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as in heaven, and forgive us as we forgive others. I don't know if this is clearer in Tagalog, uh, the, the expression uh, paranang, paranang, so, so uh, sundin ang loomo dito sa lupa, paranang sa langit. Yeah. Paranang sa langit, so on earth as in heaven, bigyan mo kami ngayon ng aming kakanin sa araw-araw at patawarin mo kami sa aming mga sala para nang pagpapatawad namin sa nakakasala sa, sa amin. So, so that para nang or para or para nang, I'm not sure the best expression, is the as in English. And in, in, in the third petition, we, we, we link heaven and earth. Huh? On earth as in heaven. It's like a, a connection. On earth as in heaven. And in this one too, the fifth petition, which we're pondering today, we could say that we're linking uh, heaven and earth. That is, we link the forgiveness that we receive from heaven to the forgiveness that we share on earth. Uh, as uh, Forgive us as we forgive others. Now, the Pope divides his reflections on this fifth petition into two parts. Uh, the first part is the one we take today, Forgive Us Our Debts. That's the title of today's talk. And then the second part is what we'll do next time, and the title is As We Forgive Our Debtors. So, it's, it's so t this time and next time are together the fifth petition. Now, we might note that the Pope uses the word, or the translation we get from the Vatican uses the word debts. Uh, in our version of the Lord's Prayer, we're, we're stuck with the word trespasses, uh, which is a little bit too bad. It, it, it's familiar to us. It's the traditional word, so it probably doesn't bother us, but usually in modern English, uh, to trespass means to go over the border of somebody's property without permission. So uh, you, you see a sign that says, private property, no trespassing, or government property, no trespassing. It means don't go here. And that's what we think of when we hear trespass. Uh, in older English, and in previous centuries, tr to trespass meant to commit an offense, an offense, uh, sin. So that's what it means when we use it in the Our Father. If you look in the Bible, uh, at least in uh, Matthew's Gospel, the, the more accurate translation is debts, almost, almost like a monetary 
uh, uh, term. And then in St. Luke's Gospel, he uses the word sins, forgive us our sins. So in Ma Matthew's Gospel, where we get the, the, our usual version of the Our Father, we say, uh, forgive us our debts. Okay, so he, uh, the Pope uses the word debts here. And he does it deliberately, I think, because he, he wants to get a, a, a bigger perspective on our position before God than, than uh, simply looking at our sins. And that's what we'll get to here in a moment. Number two, a Christian who prays asks God, first of all, that his debts be forgiven, that is, his sins, the bad things he does. This is the first truth of every prayer. <laughs> I, I'm stopping here in the middle of the sentence because you might notice uh, how often the Pope speaks about what comes first in prayer. Uh, early on in this series, in fact, for about half of the whole series, the first six or seven uh, uh, catechesis, his emphasis was that the first thing about prayer is that God is our Father. So the first thing about prayer is that we have a love relationship with the Father or that the Father loves us, uh, that the Father uh, knows what we need before we ask him, uh, that the whole, the whole uh, uh, reality of prayer is, is, a, is a relationship between a child or the children and the Father. So that, he said that many times. That's the first thing, the Father, and that's the first word, Father. Last time... In uh, talk number tw number eleven, he said that 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 first of all we are beggars, beggars for bread, and that Christian prayer begins at the level of physical needs because that's what we that's where we are. We are needy, and here he says that the first that 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 first of all we are sinners in need of forgiveness. <laughs> so you notice he, he says there's lots of different first points or starting points, and I hope this doesn't confuse anybody. Uh, the, after all, the, the question, where does prayer begin, is not a question that has only one answer. It, it, this is not an arithmetic problem that has only one correct answer. Uh, in prayer, we are opening ourselves to God, uh, and God is at the center of everything. Uh, God is in everything. He is for us in everything, in every circumstance, every moment, darkness, light, uh, trials, uh, blessings. That's where God is. So prayer, if we're, if we're going to be honest about it, prayer can start almost anywhere. It can start with any genuine human experience, any authentic reality. Uh, creation, redemption, or sanctification, it can start in any, uh, even though God, God you know, starts with his own love and he creates out of love. But from our experience, we can start just about anywhere. It's, uh, just to use an analogy, it's something like asking well, where does the ocean begin? Where does the ocean begin? Well, <laughs> it begins, in our experience, at the shore where we are, at the closest point where we first see the water. We say, oh, there's the ocean. <laughs> there's the sea. Uh, I, now I can see it. There, I, I, this is the beginning. Here's the shoreline. That's the beginning. Well, yeah, and that's true. That's true. But uh, obviously the ocean has many contact points. And someone on the other side of the ocean could also say rightfully, uh, the ocean starts here, where I am. This is where my experience of the ocean begins. Okay, and this is even tr more true of God, of course. Uh, so there are many, many right answers to the question of where prayer begins. The most relevant is, where are we right now? Where are we right now? Well, where are we standing at the edge of the ocean? Where are we in our longing for God? Where are we in our search? Where are we in our hurt? Where are we in our love for the Father? Where are we when we are sinners? Where is our need? Our need for food. Our, if we need food, we start with that. I'm hungry. My family is hungry. My loved ones are hungry. Lord, give us bread. If we're in sin, if we're experiencing the burden of guilt, we start with that. Forgive me. Forgive us. Forgive us our debts. So you see why the Pope can say it rightfully that uh, that, that this is where prayer begins. So, now we're still at the beginning of number two here. This is the first truth of every prayer. Even if we were perfect people, even if we were pure saints who never deviate from a virtuous life, we continue to be children who owe everything to the Father. So it goes back to that most fundamental truth, the identity of God as Father. 
uh, and our identity as children of God. So we, we, no matter how perfect we might be, we're still children who owe everything to our Father. What is the most dangerous attitude for every Christian life? It is pride. The most dangerous attitude is pride. It is the attitude of those who stand before God thinking that they always have their affairs in order with him. The proud think they have everything in order. Like that Pharisee in the parable who thinks he is praying in the temple, but in reality he is commending himself before God. I thank you, Lord, because I am not like the others. You know that parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the people who feel they are perfect, the people who criticize others, are proud people. None of us is perfect. No one. On the contrary, the tax collector, who was at the back of the temple, a sinner despised by everyone, stops at the threshold of the temple and does not feel worthy to enter and entrusts himself to God's mercy. And Jesus comments, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Comes from Luke 18. That is, he, come, he, he goes down to his house justified. That is, forgiven, saved. Why? Because he was not proud. Because he recognized his limitations and his sins. Now, let me try to sort out a few things here because uh, th th well, the main point is clear. That don't be proud. <laughs> That's the main point. And coming to prayer... Uh, the whole Our Father, any of the petitions, uh, pride ruins it all. It, 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 it stops the whole uh, process of prayer from the beginning. So don't be proud. Instead, be like the tax collector. So that's the main point. But the, the Pope's way of introducing this might be a little confusing because he starts out by saying, even if we were perfect, pure saints, we would still owe everything to the Father. Okay, that, that's true. That is a kind of debt. We owe everything to the Father because we got everything from him. But uh, after he's saying, even if we're pure saints, uh, we would owe everything to the Father, then he says, but to think that we're perfect, pure saints, is the worst kind of pride, because no one is perfect. So why even mention these perfect, pure saints? Well, uh, it, it, maybe it's to get us to reflect on this a little bit. Uh, w w and, and actually, Jesus' own terminology opens us to reflect on what it is that we owe to the Father. What is this debt? Uh, uh, he says, forgive us our debts. Well, what, what are our debts? Uh, we know that sins are, are debts. We know that sins are wrongdoings, offenses, and we know that they're our fault and we have to ask for forgiveness. But here the Pope reminds us that we are indebted to God even without sin, even if you set sin aside. So think of it this way. I'll, I'll try to make it clear by giving you three examples. Think of it this way. Uh, first of all, first example, I steal a thousand pesos from you. Okay, I stole it from you. That's wrong. I owe you a thousand pesos. And I also owe you an apology. <laughs> so I owe you two things, actually. Uh, I, 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 the, the offense and then the damage. It's kind of a double debt, in fact. Sin is a kind of double debt, which is related to that why we have this purifying process in purgatory. And the people in purgatory are already forgiven, but they're still correcting the damage or being corrected. Okay, so that's one, one example. I steal a thousand pesos from you. Second example, I borrow a thousand pesos from you. Well, I still owe you a thousand, right? That, that's a debt too. It's not a sin, uh, but it's still a debt. It's an obligation in justice that uh, I, ha I have a thousand pesos that I have to give back to you. Now, I'll give you, I'll give you a third example. Uh, I'm at the marketplace. Uh, I'm hungry. I don't have any money. I don't have any way to feed my family. You come along. You see my need. You approach me, and you say, here, here, take a thousand pesos. Pure gift. Out of the blue, not asked for, not deserved, not earned, not stolen, just a gift. Well, in that case, I still owe you a thousand pesos in a certain sense. In a certain sense, and not, not in justice, because, and, and not because of any offense, more of a debt of gratitude. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a, a need to acknowledge the fact that you have been merciful to me. That's the right thing to do. 
That's the debt. Uh, I think the expression in Tagalog is maybe better. Uh, utang na loob. The utang na loob. And utang na loob is not something you have, you're obliged to pay back, but you have a sense of obligation, a debt of gratitude. And, and this, is the, this is the kind of debt that Mary and the angels have to God. Uh, they, don't ask, they don't ask God for forgiveness of their debts, but they are ever ready to declare that they owe everything to God. Uh, think of the Blessed Virgin Mary and her relationship with God. Well, uh, uh, he has looked on his lowly servant in, in, in her, her nothingness, and he, uh, everything he has done is great. So that's, she's, she's, it, it, when she's proclaiming the Magnificat, she's paying back her debt to God. <laughs> Okay, you see the broader sense of the term debt. So in this very fundamental sense, we are all debtors, even those who are not sinners. There aren't any like that except the Blessed Virgin Mary. But, but even if there were, we're all debtors. And, and see, what the Pope is eliminating completely here from everyone, the good and the evil, is the idea that we are good without God, that we have everything in order. No, we don't. <laughs> if we have everything in order, it's because God gave us that gift. So, uh, but I hope, I hope in Anuim, at least, I hope that no one in Anuim has the illusion that he or she has everything in order. Uh, no one can be poor in spirit and, and at the same time think at all seriously that he has everything in order. Uh, in my experience, as soon as that idea creeps in, God is very quick to, to, to show us otherwise, that we don't have things in order. He humbles the proud and he lifts up the lowly. Isn't that true? Um, I, in in Anuim, I, I have not seen many people last too long in pride because God humbles the proud. And if people want to remain proud, they just don't hang around much longer and keep exposing themselves to the, to the sword of the word. It, it's, it's, it's actually hard to be proud in, in a group like ours. I mean, we're so small and we have so many weaknesses and so many flaws and uh, so that's, that we should be humbled in the right sense. And we should also remember that God loves to look with favor on his lowly ones. That's, that's the positive side of being Anuim, that uh, he, God loves the poor. You know, it's a good thing to be poor. Okay. How did I get on to that? Oh, yes, we're talking about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, God favors or forgives or justifies the tax collector because he is poor and lowly. How did the Pope put it? Uh, he says, uh, yes, he was, why was he forgiven and saved? Because he was not proud, because he recognized his limitations and his sins. It's two different things, but they both make us poor. Our limitations are not sins, uh, but they make us dependent on God. Our sins certainly make us dependent on God and his mercy. Number three, there are sins that are seen and sins that are unseen. There are glaring sins that make noise, but there are also sins that are devious, that lurk in our heart without us even noticing. The worst of these, these, uh, of these lurking sins, hidden sins, is pride, which can even infect people who live a profound religious life. There was once a well-known convent of nuns in the 16th and 1700s at the time of Jansenism. They were utterly perfect. And it was said of them that they were really pure like angels, but also proud like demons. It is a bad thing. Sin divides fraternity. Sin makes us imagine we are better than others. Sin makes us think we are comparable to God. It's a bad thing. He speaks here about a well-known convent, and I don't know which convent that was. He says it's well-known. I looked it up on uh, Google, but I couldn't find it. But it's easy to imagine uh, many convents like this uh, and, and many groups of religious people because this, uh, this is the danger for religious people. The, the, the trap, the hidden traps of pride are the dangers for committed religious people. That's how pride works. Uh, it, it, pride doesn't work on people with obvious sins, with what the Pope calls glaring sins. It doesn't work on them because they're obviously not perfect. Everybody knows it. So they tend to be rather humble. I've shared this before. One of the reasons I appreciate uh, working with the members of Courage is because they tend to be humble. <laughs> they, they struggle with some gross 
obvious sins, very serious sins, uh, and so they're not proud. They can grow. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to see. But it's a little counterintuitive. It doesn't seem like someone who's struggling with uh, gross sins or glaring sins can be holy. They can be if they're repentant. That's the whole point. Okay, but people whose, whose uh, exterior behavior looks perfect, that's where pride lurks. And the best examples, and, and my goodness, is the Pharisees themselves in the Gospels. Uh, they look like angels, sure. Uh, they, they, they think they are angels. And people think they are angels, but they are as proud as demons. And that's a pretty harsh thing to say, because the demons are very proud. Yeah. Now, why does the Pope even mention this convent full of proud demons, these uh, holy nuns who, who are really proud demons? Well, he, because we are reflecting on the request or the petition, forgive us our debts. The proud never ask for forgiveness. They can't pray this petition. They think they don't need to. And that's a, that's a terrible thing. The Pope says here, it's a bad thing. Sin divides fraternity. He loves this word fraternity. It, it, the translation may be not so good for us because to us a fraternity is a, a, a college club for men. But anyway, he's really talking about the human family. Sin divides the human family, it divides the, what makes us all brothers and sisters. Sin divides us. Sin makes us imagine we are better than others. Sin makes us think we are comparable to God. That's bad. Number four, and instead, we are all sinners before God. We have reason to beat our breast, everyone, like the tax collector in the temple. All of us, we all have reason to beat our breast. You know this expression. Of, it's a figure of speech, of course. It's a, a kind of an idiom. Uh, it's a, it's a make, a, make a show of remorse uh, that, that we're heart. We are, we, we are admitting our, our guilt. Uh, sometimes uh, it's, it's used in English as a, a kind of a, a superficial gesture, you know, maybe even not even, a, not even an authentic sign of repentance. But here the Pope is talking about it in the serious, in the authentic sense. We must all repent. And remember, we do this uh, not only symbolically, but actually literally, physically. We, we beat our breast when we say the prayer, I confess, the confidior, at the beginning of the Mass in the uh, penitential rite. You know the prayer, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, and in what I have failed to do. And then the rubric says, striking their breast. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. So I'm, I'm, I'm expressing repentance with my voice, with my beating of my breast, and hopefully with a contrite heart. Okay. Continuing with the Pope here, in his first letter, St. John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you want to deceive yourself, say you have not sinned. This way you are deceiving yourself. Kind of a funny way of putting it. I mean, if you want to deceive yourself, who wants to deceive himself? But this is it. Uh, what he's really saying here is, don't say I am free of sin. Don't say I have no sin. And then, because if you do, you're just deceiving yourself. Remember what St. Paul says. Uh, this is from uh, 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. I have nothing on my conscience. I, I, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't mean I'm declaring myself innocent. The Lord is the one who judges me. So he says, I, I, I can't think of any sins, but I'm not saying I'm without sin. That's a good attitude. Well, another, uh, this brings to mind a uh, related issue uh, since the Pope talks here about hidden sins that lurk in the heart without our even noticing, uh, that was in number three, and then here in number four he talks about the necessity of admitting that we have sins and that no one should say, I have no sin. Well, what about when we can't call to mind any sins? Uh, or we can't identify what our sins are. I know every confessor has, has uh, met people who want to confess and who do confess, but they, they say, well, I, I don't know what my sins are. Um, I don't know what to say. I can't think of any sins. Typical example, uh, if I visit a patient at a hospital, for example, and the person who is facing a surgery has just gone to confession a few days ago and it, it really you know, can't think of any sins that he or she committed between the last confession and this one. So 
he might say, well, gee, I want to go to confession. I'm sorry for all my sins, but I, 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 don't, I can't think of any. <laughs> well, okay, okay. They, they honestly don't know. That can happen. Uh, they know their past sins, sure, uh, sure. But those have already been confessed. So, uh, so what, what troubles them is the possibility of hidden sins that lurk beneath the surface. Well, we can repent of them, too. Uh, we must repent of them, too. Uh, we don't say we're without sin, like St. Paul. I don't have anything on my conscience, but that doesn't mean I'm declaring myself innocent. And so what we, what we say is, uh, when we say, Father, forgive us our debts, when we pray the Our Father, uh, forgive us our trespasses, we're saying even the ones we don't know, even the ones w we have forgotten. I, I, I'm not saying we can hide sins <laughs> in the confessional. No, that's a different matter. Uh, don't, don't hide any sins. But, uh, but uh, if we can't think of them or we don't, I can't call them to mind, we can still repent of them. In fact, there's a, there's a psalm about this very thing, Psalm 19, verse 13. But who can detect his own errors? Free me, Lord, from my hidden faults. Free me, Lord, from my hidden faults. That's included in the Our Father uh, when we say, forgive us our debts. So it's enough to say, I'm a sinner, Lord, have mercy. I'm a sinner, Lord, have mercy. Uh, don't worry about hidden sins or forgotten sins, but don't say you don't have any sins either. Okay, number five. We are debtors above all because we have received much in this life, a father and a mother, friendship, the splendors of creation. Even if, all, even if we all happen to experience difficult days, we must always remember that life is a grace. It is a miracle that God drew out of nothing kind of funny. In number four, he stresses that we're all sinners. Here in number five, he jumps back to the point that we are all debtors, not because we're sinners. Uh, we're debtors because we receive everything from God. It goes back to that utang nalaob again, this debt of gratitude. The debt not based on sin, but on being recipients from God. Number six, secondly, so first of all, we're debtors because we receive everything. Secondly, he says, we are debtors because even if we are able to love, none of us is capable of doing so solely by our own strength. True love is when we can love, but through the grace of God. None of us shines of our own light. So we're debtors because we have received much, not only because we're sinners, and we are debtors because we cannot truly love on our own strength. We are dependent. So again, uh, not, not, not because we're sinners. There is what the ancient theologians called the Mysterium Lunae. Not only in the identity of the church, the church is the Mysterium Lunae, but also in the history of each of us. What does this Mysterium Lunae mean? This is a Latin expression. It means the mystery of the moon. The mystery of the moon. Buon, the buon. That it is like the moon, which does not have its own light. It reflects the light of the sun, nor do we have our own light. The light we have is a reflection of God's grace, of God's light. If you love, it is because someone other than yourself made you smile when you were a child, teaching you to respond with a smile. If you love, it is because someone beside you has awakened you to love, making you understand that the meaning of life lies therein. He's giving examples of reflected love, uh, experiencing the love of God through these the goodness of people throughout our life. So uh, this awareness that love does not start with us is, is really very important. It, it, it's true that we, uh, we have to make decisions to love, and we have to do this all the time, and decisions are always, in a sense, rooted in the one who makes the decision, so that, yes, it's a starting point. But love doesn't start with our decision. We are already recipients of love. Even by being created, we are already, already recipients of love. We are loved first. You can think of that uh, passage from St. John's letter, the first letter, chapter, uh, John, first John chapter 4, verse 10, the love of God consists in this, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent his son in expiation for our sins. So it doesn't start with us loving God. It starts with God loving us. Now, about this Mysterium Lunae, this is an ancient image. As he says, it's a favorite of the ancient theologians. 
it's a rich image and it gives us insight into uh, how we progress both in the spiritual life and in our human relationships even when we are experiencing darkness which is often <laughs> we're, we're like sinners uh, sinners we're like sailors <laughs> sailors on the vast sea at night uh, well how, how do we know where we are and how do we know where to go well we look up into the heavens it's dark but there are there are lights there are lights so uh, if we can't see the sun and half the time we can't because it's nighttime well then we look to the moon which is the same light but a reflected light uh, it's the same light that the, the, all the light of the moon comes from the sun but it's reflected so and this image is right in the catechism i didn't know this but i discovered it in this time of preparation catechism number 748 the church has no other light than christ's according to a favorite image of the church fathers the church is like the moon the moon all its light reflected from the sun so the church is the mysterium lunae the mystery of the moon now those of you who are familiar with father francis's work know that he had his own experience very personal experience of this mystery of light and of reflected light and of how the light of god is communicated to us through the liturgy uh, it's always all, all the light is the same it always comes from god all light comes from god but it comes to us through in this reflected way and it's you could say refracted through the liturgical year and uh, what father francis the term father francis used to describe this is the cosmic analogy a kind of unfortunate name because uh, in, instead of making making clear what was which is a fairly uh, simple and straightforward analogy uh, it, it gives the impression of being so otherworldly and so uh, mysterious so cosmic that we can't understand it and, and i think that was not father francis's intention but that's uh, how it sounded at least to us who were what do we know uh, his followers when he said cosmic analogy we would just get a blank look on our face what's he talking about well, he wrote about this cosmic analogy in one of his pastoral letters. Um, some of you might know this booklet. This comes way, from way back in uh, 1991, January 13, 1991. The title of the, this booklet is The Origin and Historical Development of the Anuim Icons. And uh, he describes where, where he got this idea. I'll just read this section to you from this uh, booklet of Father Francis, our founder. Uh, this is from page six, the cosmic analogy, paragraph number 11, the cosmic analogy, this is his term now, I, 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 I want to honor Father Francis's term, and he, what he's describing here is the mysterium lunae, but in, in, a, in a bigger way, even more. In fact, if you want to understand what I, where I'm going here, you can look on the back of your handout and you can see the Father Francis's own simple schema of the cosmic analogy there. On one side, the celestial plan, meaning the cosmos, and then on the right side, the ecclesial plan, meaning the church. So what's in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the universe is, is what's in nature, and then what's in supernature in the church on the, uh, on the right side. So this is what uh, Father Francis says. The cosmic analogy came about rather mysteriously through another experience at the seminary. So he's a young man now in his 20s in the seminary. One day, while praying my office, meaning the liturgy of the hour, as we call it now, I had the distinct impression that I was in outer space. It was as though I was on some mysterious planet in total darkness. I was unable to discern what was under my feet. There was no light at all. I could only tell that it was firm ground. And yet, I still had the impression that I was in outer space. My impressions, my reflections on this grew into the cosmic analogy so you think of the experience of being in the dark knowing that you're standing on something solid but not being able to see it uh, so there's there's something to be confident in but there's also something to be afraid of darkness and uh, experience of solidity m m paragraph number 12 from father francis now i will attempt to explain how i saw this in terms of faith liturgy ex itself i began to see was a faith experience we are as it were on a journey walking in the darkness of faith literally blind faith 
in this journey, I saw everything is centered around the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the Son, of course. The Eucharist took on the same place as the Son in relation to our solar system. And the moon represented Mary, Mysterium Lunae, Mary. I found myself as though walking on the dark earth looking at the moon, which appeared reflecting the light of the sun. Okay, the very same thing the church fathers uh, used. How can, how can you travel in the dark if you don't have any sunshine? Well, we do have sunshine reflected by the moon. Okay, and then Father Francis says, uh, the planets symbolized the saints and the stars. I, I'm sorry, the planets rep uh, symbolized the saints and the stars represented the angels in the heavens all the heavenly court who are celebrated in the liturgy throughout the year. This seemed to make sense even historically, for all the navigators in ancient times who traveled by land or sea used the moon and the stars to make their way to their destination by night. This fact speaks admirably of our journey of faith, especially through the liturgical year. What I, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking uh, what Pope Francis mentions uh, about the Mysterium Lunae, the, this experience of reflected light, and expanding it uh, based on what Father Francis said. Now, I, as I say, I put that at the bottom of your handout. This uh, this uh, business here is is just a uh, a photo taken from this booklet. So here, I'll, I'll show you in the booklet. This is on page uh, page eight, page eight of the booklet. You can see the same thing: cosmic analogy. There's the celestial plan and the Ecclesial plan, celestial meaning the natural, the solar system, and then the ecclesial meaning the church. Okay, so now let's get back to the Pope here. I don't want to run out of time. I hope that's interesting too. This is part of Anuam's spirituality. Okay, let's go back to number seven. You see that this mystery of reflected light or this mysterium lunae has many practical implications. This is not just a, a theoretical or, or you know kind of a spiritual escape. Uh, it has many implications, especially in the face of what looks dark to us, what looks dark to us in ourselves, in the church, in the lives of our fellow sinners. So this is where the Pope goes. Number seven, let us try to listen to the story of some person who has made mistakes. Okay, a sinner, a detainee, a convict, a drug addict. We know many people who make mistakes in life. We all do. Notwithstanding the responsibility, which is always personal, you sometimes ask yourself who is to blame for their mistakes, whether it is just their conscience or the history of hatred and abandonment that some carry within. Uh, who, who's, who's at fault here? Well, it, it, this is always a question. It's always a mystery. It, everyone is at the same time guilty and also a victim, a culprit and a, a victim. Let's continue with number eight. And this after mentioning this experience of sinners, he says, this is the mystery of the moon. First and foremost, we love because we have been loved. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And if someone has not been illumined by the light of the sun, he becomes icy, like the ground in winter. Now, not putting judgment on the sinner or the convict or the drug addict, we don't know what light he or she has received. But we are responsible ourselves to receive the light, the, the love of God first. Now, that's our responsibility, no matter what anyone else has or has done or has done to us. Otherwise, we're the ones who become the icy, frozen ground, the, 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 the frozen footpath, which cannot receive love or the word. Th think again of that Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee and the tax collector in that parable, uh, they, they both look like they're praying. But the Pharisee does not allow himself to be loved. So he can't love. Because he's not accepting the love of the Father, he does not love his fellow man, the tax collector, either. Or if you want to think of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it's another example of the same dynamic. That rich man blocks love in his own heart, and so he ends up condemning himself. He receives but he doesn't accept and he doesn't give. He doesn't love Lazarus, which is his obligation. Okay, let's go to number nine. How can we fail to recognize in the chain of love that precedes us, the chain of love that precedes us, I mean, what we have already received or what has, before we even thought of loving, we we're already recipients of love. 
How can we fail to recognize in the chain of love that precedes us also the presence of God's providential love? None of us loves God as much as he has loved us. You can underline that one. That's for sure. In fact, it's, it's almost funny to say it, but it's good to call it to mind. None of us loves God as much as he has loved us. Not even close. It is enough to place oneself before a crucifix to understand the disproportion. He has loved us and will always love us first, overwhelmingly more than we ever love him in return. Let us therefore pray, Lord, not even the most holy in our midst cease to be in your debt. O Father, have mercy on us all. See, he makes some rapid shifts here at the end of him, from looking at sinners to looking at ourselves to looking at the crucifix uh, and to recognizing that even the, even the most holy among us are still in the debt of God. So the point here is that when we pray this fifth petition of the Our Father, this is the, the whole point of this talk, uh, that this fifth petition is forgive us our debts. When we pray this petition, we do so because we are debtors. Debtors. And because, and I mean, not only are we debtors, but we are also confident in the love of God. There's never any proportion between his love for us and our response, and there's never any proportion between his love for us and our love for another. The love that we have for those who have sinned against us is what comes up in the next part, the, next, the, next, the second half of the fifth petition, uh, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Okay, we'll get to that next time. Uh, but it, it's essential that we have the first part in place first, meaning th th that we are debtors before God, uh, all of us. And the chain of love starts with God. It does not start with our love for those who offend us. Okay, which is a great thing to know. Because otherwise we, would have no, we wouldn't start at all. If we were to start with our love for people who offend us, we wouldn't even have a beginning point. So we have the great beginning point, the love of God for us, us sinners. So forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, I leave you with these questions or points for reflection and sharing. Uh, the first one comes from the very first paragraph. Uh, just as we need bread, we also need forgiveness. This too, this every day. Do you experience the need for bread and for forgiveness every day? We might get hungry every day, but are we aware of our need for forgiveness every day? How can you be more conscious of your debts to God? Debts in the broad sense the Pope uses, not just debts of sin, but uh, the fact that we are, uh, have re received everything from God, okay? And even the capacity to love is, is still starts with God. So how can you be more conscious of your debts to God? Number two, this is a, a, a direct uh, quotation from the paragraph number eight, just right above you here. Uh, this is the mystery of the moon. First and foremost, we love because we have been loved. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And if someone has not been illuminated by the light of the sun, he becomes icy like the ground in winter. How does this image apply to your own life? This, this understanding of, uh, of reflected light. And what, what, when, you, when have you experienced the reflected light of God in dark moments? reflected by other persons or, or in creation, uh, use, or, or by the angels and the saints, or by the Blessed Virgin Mary, reflected light. And when have you been icy ground? When have you been icy ground? And closing yourself from the light that comes from God, either directly or through the mis mystery of the moon. Okay, and then number three, another long quotation from, it's from paragraph number nine. In fact, I think it's the whole of paragraph number nine. Um, the Pope himself asks this question, how can we fail to recognize in the chain of love that precedes us also the presence of God's providential love? How can we fail to, to recognize it? Well, do you fail to recognize it? <laughs> do we fail to recognize it? We do sometimes, so how can that be? None of us loves God as much as he has loved us. It is enough to place oneself before a crucifix to understand the disproportion. He has loved us and will always love us. So just share... Just take this statement in for a moment, ponder it a moment, and then just share on what this statement of Pope Francis means to you. Okay, good. So uh, that brings us to our conclusion. We'll end here. Uh, I'll give you a blessing, and then you can uh, take some time for prayer and then break up into your 
sharing groups. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.